Okay, I hadn't originally planned on doing a video on this radio, but I thought, well, since I'm doing a series on uh, soldering techniques and little tips and tricks and uh, trying to help people out that uh, have never really soldered much, I thought this would be a perfect example um, because this radio suffers from bad solder joints. So, uh, the customer that owns this radio has had this for a little over 17 years. When he started driving, he's a truck driver, drives a tractor trailer, 18 wheeler. Um, when he started working for this company, he bought this radio brand new and has been using it ever since. Uh, and that's probably one of the hardest things on a mobile radio are trucks and dump trucks being the worst. Now he's driving an actual tractor trailer, but uh, dump trucks tend to be the worst and probably the worst amongst those are going to be some of your Macs and your like international pay stars or the load stars. Um, the really heavy duty off road styles because they ain't got much of a suspension, honestly. <laughs> so, and this is the way your majority of your mobile radios are mounted solder side up, components down. So, every time the vehicle hits a bump, the radio jerks. The parts are trying to rip themselves out of the circuit board. So, big heavy things like capacitors, that's one of the reasons they put that goopy. You know, unfortunately, it's corrosive and becomes conductive, but that glue they use, that's why they usually glue a lot of these heavy parts, is so they don't, don't break loose. But stuff like these connectors, which is where this radio is apparently having problems, a lot of these, these header connectors, you've got all this wiring harness pulling on it, and eventually it breaks, breaks a lot of those solder connections. So this one had been sent to someone else, and they couldn't fix it. <laughs> so it got brought to me. And... I just took the covers off and looked at it, and yeah, somebody's been doing a yee soldering job on it. I'm going to have to straighten out that mess. That's another whole other story. But uh, I did right off the bat, even with no magnification, no magnifying glass, no microscope, just with the naked eye actually looking over top of my glasses. But uh, I could see that uh, I could find some bad solder joints. There's you know a couple back here. And what I'll usually do is take a Sharpie. I'll closely look over the board. Anytime I find a bad connection, if you can see the tips of these terminals, I don't know how well it shows up in the camera, but the tips of all of those leads are red. And that's just an indicator. So anytime I see, you know, there's a bad bad solder joint, I'll make the tip red. So I know, you know, I can go over the entire circuit board, look for bad solder joints, and then come back and fix them at a later time. You know, when I get right, once I've completely inspected the entire board. So now that I've done that, I had actually started on this and I thought, well, hell, I'm doing soldering, so why not just use this in the soldering series? So what I've got so far, I was doing this header socket and that was the one you saw the, the plug was unplugged from the top side. So the way I'd normally do big plugs like this, I always unplug the plug from the other side first. But if you unsolder, and what I'd like to do is, because you can see, if you can see how non-shiny these are, they're ox the lead and tin has oxidized, okay? See, I just me rubbing this over top of it brings a little shiny, shiny back to it, okay? You do not want to just reflow that solder. You can end up with the exact same problem you had before, before you touched it. Um, if the solder joints are something like back here, you see that's still nice and shiny, but it might be broken out, yes. You can come in with your soldering iron, a little bit of solder, and just touch it up, and it'll usually be fine. If you see signs of oxidation like this, you really should desolder it first. Because if that oxidation then mixes in with your solder, you'll have a contaminated solder joint that is, no matter how good of a solder you use, is going to be extremely prone to having problems and breaking loose again, because it's going to have all kinds of inclusions of all of that oxidation and deposits in there. So what I like to do is... I'll solder usually like I'll desolder and resolder, you know, some of the end pins. Then I can come back through and then desolder all of the rest of them. Now, uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to desolder these. But like I say, I don't want the pins to fall out or the the whole connector to fall out the other side of the board. So I'll desolder this one and this one first. Clean it up a little bit, resolder those two, then I can do all the rest of the remaining ones in the middle. So Grab my sock desoldering iron here. Tip a wipe. I'm trying to do this. It'll be a first for me. Actually, I almost need to come in from the side with the camera. Now, 
I didn't desolder too bad. Uh, looking around. Actually, I think I am going to add. It never hurts to have a little bit of extra flux, especially because when you're desoldering, there's no solder, fresh solder to start with. That'll help to break that oxidation layer. So, now I have both of those desoldered. I can now come in and apply a little bit of fresh new solder. So now those are good to go and should last the life of the radio. Now I can come back in with the desoldering iron and desolder all the remaining ones. back in. Always give your soldering iron a wipe. Don't want to be having a bunch of oxidation and stuff off a dirty tip getting into your brand new solder. And there. Now I will come back in now a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Now normally if I'm doing the whole work, which I'll do, but just for demonstration purposes I'm going to clean up the one spot because I always clean the entire board because this entire board needs to be gone back over because like I say somebody's really screwed up a lot of the solder joints on this. So this entire board will be getting a scrubbing down. And there you can see we have nice shiny solder joints with a good fillet and what the fillet is we we'll use this sharpie as a demonstration so if this is your lead sticking up out of the circuit board and this is the circuit board surface you can see a lot of these solder joints where somebody's resoldered it they're just huge big round balls of solder and there's actually a few spots on here you come back here uh, where was that one right there you see that ball? I don't know how close I can get. But you see the ball of solder, okay? And I just knocked over my isopropyl bottle. Move that back here. But you see that ball of solder? So I get the feeling that the person who resoldered this held the iron on the side of the lead, which is fine, because that's going to be your the greatest suck, you know, it's going to be the thing that's sucking the most thermal you know, have the most thermal contact and it's got the most thermal mass because of, you know, this, the solid copper lead. It's going to suck the most heat out. So, you know, they brought their lead in, but they never let the, so the soldering iron come down and touch the actual trace pad. So there's a ball of solder stuck to the lead, but you can see it never flowed out onto the circuit board. You look at these factory solder joints that surround it, see how they're flowed out? That's the fillet. Nice little, it looks like a pyramid or, you know, a volcano is would be a good analogy. You can see all these solder joints here, the factory ones, you got that nice little fillet where you can see every single thing that the person reflowed, these huge blobbing mountains of goo with sometimes you can see a lead kind of poke through the top so yeah, it doesn't look like the solder really stuck that well to it. So, like I say, on, on solder traces that are oxidized especially, like we're up here at the front like I just did, definitely a good idea to desolder them first, get rid of that contaminated oxidized solder, and start with fresh. And I'd actually, that's where I decided to start this video, that's what I was actually doing to this one. I had you know, already desoldered and resoldered these pins, and then did all the center ones, so actually I can just go ahead and finish soldering them now. Now you see how I bring the soldering iron in from the side, I touch the lead, and then also bring the, now this is a chisel tip, okay? Let me clean it off actually so you can really see the profile of the tip. Okay, it's a chisel tip. It's flat on both sides, okay? But I'll bring the flat part up to the side of the lead, 
and then kind of drop it down and touch the pad. That way I'm getting good thermal contact and, and you always want to pre-tin the iron because that gives it the best chance of making good thermal contact because that solder can then make a bridge to transfer the heat over which that, that way you're heating not only the lead but the pad as well. Where that solder joint you look back at the back looks like it only, they only heated the lead and no heat ever made it to the pad so the solder didn't completely flow out onto the pad. And a good rule of thumb is, is it should never take longer than two seconds to make a solder connection. Any more time than two seconds, and you start to risk damaging your pads. Um, and that greatly depends on what solder you're using, uh, what the melting point of the solder is. But you have to remember, these copper traces are bonded to this board. They're, you know, it's epoxy. So... Uh, soldering temperature and the breakdown point of epoxy are right around the same temperature. So if you have if your dwell time on a solder joint is too long, you stand a really really good chance of damaging or lifting traces. So that's just something to be aware of. Like I say, good soldering practice. Don't dwell on it too long. So if you have uh, one of those all you know non-adjustable soldering irons, you're kind of stuck at whatever temperature. It's set at from the factory, but if you have one that's adjustable, you can play around with it. Find out what the diameter of solder you're using, and you'll also find that it, it also varies depending on what the thermal mass of the surrounding circuit trace is as well. So, soldering something here is going to take more heat or a, or ideally a larger tip. So the bigger the mass is, that's where you get into the, what do you do? Do you want your solder joints to be NASA perfect or uh, what I call repair bench, right? Because <laughs> you, there's lots of different tip sizes, okay? So you can see, actually we get, you know, much smaller. And I, I've got even smaller than this one I'm getting ready to grab. This is a, I think this is what, a 16th. I've got some 32nd. Uh, size tips, but you know there's lots of different tips now ideally what you would do is is pick the larger The thermal mass especially if you're doing double-sided boards You want a bigger tip that has more thermal you know can for starters can store a little bit more thermal energy and easily transfer it down, but you know best practice and like I say we're not building uh, space shuttles um, we're working on radios no matter how, how high-end, even, you know, the, the top-of-the-line ham radios. Uh, like I say, in my case, this is probably my go-to size tip here. You, know, you can see it's not too big, not too small. It's perfect for doing through-hole components like this. Um, now, if I do get into bigger bigger stuff, especially if I'm doing old tube-type stuff, I definitely switch to a different, I just use a different iron. I have so many irons that, you know, I don't, I don't have to change tips all the time. I just grab a different hand piece that I already have different tips in. But uh, this one's perfect for doing, you know, 90 plus percent of what I'm doing on on normal through hole components. So, like I say, now you can see the difference. The solder joints that I just did here, nice little fillets nice and shiny you can see there's actually sign and that's another thing when you pull your tip away you should always do what they call wiping removal when you pull the solder your soldering iron tip away don't pull it out like this always try to like wipe it and what that does is especially if it's a fresh cut lead and there's exposed copper on the end the idea being is when you do a, what they call wiping removal the idea is, is to bring a little bit of solder up over the tip of the lead end to get full coverage of the entire lead. So, well, like I say, you can see those and these that I just did compared to these other ones that someone else did that are big and blobby. And the problem is when you have closely spaced pins like this, you stand a really good chance of having shorts in between here, especially if you get, which I did see a lot of those on the board, little solder balls. It's a little solder ball gets trapped in this flux residue because someone didn't clean it off <coughs> again. <laughs> um, you know, it's just that's sloppy work. 
So good solder joints should look basically like the factory does. Now, like I say, mine usually have a little bit more solder on them. Um, now you have to remember, these boards were wave soldered. All of the components were stuffed into this circuit board, and this board was uh, run over top of a molten bath of solder. It's called wave soldering. There's a little wave front. It's a whole science behind that, how that works. But uh, it comes up and kisses the underside of the board. And then, then what happens is, is they run these through a belt sander, basically. And basically, that's why a lot of times you'll see little burrs stuck over on a lot of components. There were actually some burrs on some of these before I desoldered them. But that's where those burrs come from. When they, actually, this one right here has got a little bit of a piece of the stuck. That's why it's so wide. But uh, like I say, that's good solder joints. Those bad sloppy work. Another thing, I cleaned it off. That way I can inspect my work. How in the hell do you inspect your work when you have all of this glopped up goop? You can't see anything through all the rosin. You see right there. There's a solder. There's a little solder ball right there. We don't want that in there. That shit can break loose and bounce around, short out between terminals. So yeah, really, really sloppy soldering work. So you should have nice, shiny, good-looking solder joints when you're done. When you're done soldering on things. I'm trying to get the light at different angles so you see what that looks like. But like I say, it should look like a little pyramid. That's the whole idea. Just like the factory ones did here originally. Nice little pyramid. So there you go. There's some tips on resoldering old oxidized solder joints.